Lord Adair Turner, thank you very much for agreeing to an interview. I wanted to ask you about your views on renewable energy and the battle to address climate change, given your role on the Energy Transitions Commission. Yep. Could you give a flavour of the ETC and its principal findings? Well, I think what's useful is to compare what I now believe as a result of the ETC work with what I believed back in 2008 when I was first chair of the UK Climate Change Committee. And the, there is very, very good news that the progress of renewables has been, I think, far faster than anybody dreamed possible back then. Or at least, the, no, that, that's probably unfair. There were some people who dreamed it was possible, but the, the standard point of view uh, did not believe it was possible. So the cost of uh, solar energy is down something like 85 or even 90 percent compared with where it was in 2008. The cost of uh, wind is down 65 or 70 percent. And I remember that on the Climate Change Committee, we did you know, analysis of how fast the cost of solar and wind would come down. And, you know, I rather hope that somebody's destroyed them now because they'll be a bit embarrassing how conservative they were. And so if you'd asked me 10 years ago, how do we decarbonize electricity production? I would have said then that you'd be crazy not to back three technologies renewables, carbon capture and storage, and nuclear. And that if you knocked any one of those out, you were making life far more difficult. And indeed, although I always believe that the sort of late 21st century, we will move to a solar economy. I mean, that's the ultimate answer. I thought it would be several decades ago before it was cheap enough to do that. We, the cost of this has now come so far down that the key conclusion in the ETC report is that you can envisage within 15 years or so, building systems which by then are 85 or 90 percent dependent on intermittent renewables and you can deal with the costs of intermittency and backup and storage with batteries for overnight and with gas peaking plants for the last 10 percent or so and if you put that together as a package those systems which are 85 or 90 percent intermittent renewables can be fully competitive with fossil fuels and that is a much more optimistic point of view uh, than where I was in 2008. So that is, that's fantastic news uh, for the planet. The process of technological uh, progress and scale economy uh, is working. Um, and therefore, what the ETC says is the one thing that we must clearly get on with as quickly as possible is that process of decarbonizing electricity systems and applying electricity to as much as the economy as possible. And the big thing that we're doing as a follow up on that within the ETC now is a major uh, uh, project, a piece of work in India over the next two years to you know, work out uh, very closely with Indian corporates and the Indian government. Is it possible? And I'm sure it is for India basically to drive large increases of uh, electricity uh, supply uh, while relying entirely on renewables for the expansion from now on. So that's the optimistic part of the story. Thank you, Adair. Well, it's wonderful to hear because my book is intended to be optimistic, optimistic right. hopeful. Yep. I wanted to ask how the message from the ETC has been received by the incumbents. Right. Um, I mean, are they on board? Because it feels like we're shifting a massive tank. Yes, um, I think what's interesting, you know, we have uh, incumbents on board, in particular, you know, Michelle, or a major member of the ETC, uh, and VP are about uh, to join. different sense, companies like Tata, a major steel company producing uh, steel with coke and coal, etc. Um, uh, I think, broadly speaking, what's happening is that in the electricity sector, and I would say we don't at the moment have a big incumbent electricity player, um, they're sort of disappearing, in, if certainly in the, in the UK, but even in other countries. I think most intelligent incumbent players know that in the in the developed world know that coal has just got to go right coal uh, thermal power uh, a, a production most of them are giving up the dream that in the developed world you'll put CCS on the back of coal and keeping it going I mean Britain by 2025 will have no coal whatsoever in its uh, in, in its uh, power generation system 
Um, and m major uh, fossil fuel companies such as Shell had already taken the step of largely getting out of coal and getting into gas. Now, the overall figures are is that if we are serious about well below two degrees centigrade, and even if you think we can develop a significant amount of carbon capture and storage over the next two decades, then broadly speaking, the amount of coal that we burn has got to come down by 70%. The amount of oil that we use has got to come down by 25% by 2040. Um, uh, but the amount of gas can be roughly at the current level. So I think the incumbents, they take this on account. I think they still tend to believe that oil will last longer than I think it, it you know, that the, the, the peak oil is further away than it needs to be for the clients, but for the climate. And I think they tend to think that there's a major expansion opportunity for gas, whereas gas really has to be flat. So are they moving their opinions? Yes, very significantly. Um, is it easy for them to directly take this on board? No, not yet. So our figures would suggest that uh, oil use will have to peak and come down from the early 2020s. Their realistic point of view is it may not. I mean, I think there is a disconnect here between, and you see it in the UK figures, we are making, in a sense, more rapid progress than we thought we would on the decarbonisation of electricity. But so far, the decarbonisation of uh, cars is going slower than we hoped, essentially because the improvements of efficiency so far are being offset by people buying bigger and bigger cars. Right. Thank you. Dad. That's an important point. I wanted to ask you about negative emissions technologies, because right. some of the climate science suggests even if we do all of what you describe, we still need to effectively draw carbon out of the atmosphere. Has the report, has your work touched on this issue? Well, it hasn't so far, but we are looking at it slightly. We're not looking at it so far in the sense of simply we're going to overshoot and therefore we've got to plug into our models the idea that in 60, in 2060 and 70 we'll suck a whole load of carbon out. Where we've begun to look at it uh, is in relation to the creation of truly zero carbon synthetic fuels, in particular for aviation. Uh, aviation is a challenge in the sense that in most other sectors of the economy, you, 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 we can ultimately deal, we can ultimately live without a hydrocarbon uh, energy source. Um, we, we can make electricity without coal or gas. Uh, we can make uh, we can replace coking coal with hydrogen in steel uh, production. Uh, we can replace the, 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 uh, the, some of the inputs to cement bracing process. We can electrify that, uh, the heat process. But aviation is, uh, and we can undoubtedly uh, decarbonize uh, surface transport by electric cars and by either electric or probably also hydrogen uh, for long distance trucking. When you get to aviation, um, although people are now playing around with the idea of battery power, and short distance uh, flight and hydrogen powered medium distance flight, it, to get a plane across the Atlantic, we probably need the energy density of liquid hydrocarbons. So, and there's two ways to do that. There's either biofuels or there's synfuels. Um, biofuels, the issue is what is the total sustainable sort of biomass, bioenergy production. But synfuels is very interesting. So we are looking at the idea of how, do, and there are companies now looking at it, making synthetic hydrocarbons um, out of uh, essentially um, sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere by direct air capture, making hydrogen from electrolysis and then synthesizing the hydrocarbon by putting the hydrogen and the uh, CO2 uh, together. Uh, and I think that may well be uh, part of the way forward for aviation. Whether it will ever make sense to do just sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere as an end per se, and then putting it into carbon capture and storage, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you, Adair.
got three last questions for you. One around the Global Apollo project, which oh, yeah. I believe you had a hand in. I did. And I write about that in the book. Yeah. One about China. I'd love to hear your thoughts on China. And then a third around the just transition. Yeah. But to start with the Global Apollo project, how do you feel it's faring three years well, on? The Global Apollo project essentially led to mission innovation. Yeah. Um, uh, and there have been commitments to uh, the British government, the French government, have made commitments to increase the level of the uh, <laughs> very dangerous thing to, um, uh, to increase the level of uh, uh, funding and then to try and focus um, the funding on the mission critical tasks. Um, I haven't had a close relationship with it over the last year or so, but I think we will from now on because I think as the ETC now firms up our point of view on what we call the hard to abate sectors, because in mm -hmm. addition to the work on India, we're also doing a major piece of work on how do you take the emissions out of long distance uh, transport, trucking, aviation and shipping and heavy industry, steel, cement, um, chemicals, etc. And I think uh, what we may well come out of in that is a set of, as it were, mission critical breakthroughs. Now, some of them are sort of obvious. I mean, batteries is just the most obvious thing. And uh, I, I think further public support is required for it. I mean, basically, the good news on batteries is that the cost of lithium ion batteries has come down and down and down. And the cost breakthroughs, I think, have been beyond people's expectations. And it's really possible that by 2025, uh, the initial cost of buying a car will be cheaper uh, but to buy an electric car than to buy um, a fossil fuel car because the uh, lower cost of the engine will offset the fact that you've got to put in a battery, the battery will mm -hmm. come down in cost. But as long as we're with liquid electrolyte uh, lithium ion, um, we just do face some absolute physical limits in terms of energy density. I mean, mm -hmm. kilowatt hours per kilogram or per liter you get in there. So there are huge numbers of people now working across the world now to try and get breakthroughs of new chemistries, either which will produce lower cost, but not necessarily higher density. That will be relevant in the static environment, the utility space. But in the mobile space, in the transport space, we're going to the stage where the crucial thing is not further cost reduction. It's the, the energy density side. So that's absolutely crucial. And I think we will be talking to Mission Innovation more about that. But that's the obvious one. The ones which are less obvious, which I think they'll need to focus on, are there things in carbon capture and storage which need technological breakthroughs mm -hmm. as well as in, in terms of the solvents that are used, etc., uh, as well as uh, 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 just scaling up. Uh, fuel cells uh, may be very important, uh, and there may be other, you know, Sin fuels may be important. So what we intend at the end of the work on the low carbon, the, the, the hard to abate sectors, is to aggregate up what does all of this apply for the R&D side, and then we will be going to mission innovation and talking about it. Thank you, Adair. Very clear. And on China, has the ETC looked at China, or has your well, own have, work... We have Chinese them? members. You've got Chinese members, uh, yeah. I am yeah. out there next Friday talking at a session uh, on... Chinese uh, mm -hmm. energy transition. Uh, we are trying to get more uh, members in China um, uh, and we may try and set up an ETC in China. I mean, the overall story on China is that, of course, it is now the biggest emitter in the world. Um, uh, even on a per capita basis, its emissions are about to or have actually overtaken uh, the UK and, and France, so it can no longer say the reason why I'm a big emitter is that I'm lots of people, and even on a per capita basis, they're getting big. Uh, that is for two reasons. It's one, because they've driven industrialization with electricity, which has primarily come from coal. And the other is that they have been on an extraordinary construction boom, and that has generated huge demand for steel and cement, and steel and cement, if you make them in the classic fashion, are, are also very carbon intensive. Now, the Chinese are serious about this. They're scientists, you know, tell the leadership and the leadership believes that climate change is important. Um, and, you know, so alongside the fact that China is at one level a big problem, uh, given the way that it has grown, there are huge commitments on renewable energy development, huge commitments on electric vehicles. But in lots of ways, China is ahead of us. I mean, I don't know, if you go to Beijing, I have not seen, I don't think, for the last two years in Beijing, a single 
um, fossil fuel two-wheeler. Mm -hmm. All uh, the motorbikes, uh, the scooters, uh, the electric bicycles, they're all electric. Now, right. at the moment, that electricity is coming from coal. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, China is also sitting on an enormous potential uh, advantage, which it has within a unified political area. It has in its western provinces, in, in Tibet, in uh, Xinhai, in, in Mongolia, in Xinjiang. It has huge solar and wind resource in underpopulated places where the cost of land is very low. So what we are hoping to engage with in China is really to take their desire uh, to head towards carbon uh, reductions and to help to accelerate it, because I think they're sitting on the opportunity to do it at far lower cost even than they, they had realized. I mean, so uh, I was with a major uh, Chinese uh, power generator the other day, and we looked together at the map of China, and they said, look, if we cover 5% of this land area of West China with solar PV, we can produce 6,000 terawatt hours of electricity, which is all of the electricity that China currently uses. And we can get that electricity to East Coast China at uh, 4.5 cents per kilowatt hour, which would be far cheaper than their coal plant. And, and they think they can do that by the mid 2020s. So China, I'm a medium term optimist, but we need to turn this tank around quickly because right today it's putting a lot of CO2 up into the atmosphere and that CO2, of course, is accumulating. Thank you, Adair. How do we tell the story that this is good for workers, good for the economy, good for jobs, etc.? How do we take on the politics of the anti? Yeah, look, in the developed world, at one level, the jobs issue is much, much easier yeah. than it is sometimes presented to be. In the UK, there are effectively no Trump said, I back coal because, you know, I'm with coal miners. There is a sort of iconic belief in the coal miner as the great macho industrial figure. But America has very, very few coal miners left. Of course, they're concentrated in very particular bits of, you know, Kentucky, uh, etc., Appalachian Mountains. Um, but you know, most coal mining is an incredibly... Uh, capital intensive thing done with enormous trucks and small numbers of people. Um, and so you need a vision of how to deal with that. Uh, coal fired power stations don't employ many people. So in most of the developed world, the issue of moving away from coal, you know, <laughs> it's happened already. You know, Britain had 700,000 coal miners in 1950 and it has none today. Uh, and actually, a lot of these problems in the developed world are far smaller than the problems of deindustrialization of the great big labor intensive steel mills concentrated in the northeast or Scotland that we went through in the 60s and 70s. That, that deindustrialization story is sort of done. Um, and by the way, that's important because what actually happens here is there is a lot of you know, capital intensive blow the top off a mountain with dynamite and scoop it out of an open cast coal mining companies. Use the iconic image of a sort of, you know, coal miner with black dust on his face to, to, to win a political debate, which, which isn't true any longer. So if, first of all, there's elements of this just transition which are not problems and we need to... You know, there are elements which are problems. If you go to India, there probably are five million people dependent on the coal mining industry, and they are concentrated in particular bits of industry in, of India in Bihar. So uh, India has to have a vision of how it, how it deals uh, with that. Um, what are the other issues of the just transition? I mean, there is obviously an issue about if renewable energy is more expensive. And at the moment, there is a bit of a cost penalty. It's coming down and down. Um, and if you therefore say, I mean, if, if everybody in Britain has the same income, right, I would simply say, OK, we'll increase the price of electricity. So what? Uh, you know, on average income, the increase in the electricity bill is completely affordable. And if it gives you some incentives to go and be intelligent about insulating your house and making sure, you know, it, it, but there is a distributional issue, which is. Uh, people with under badly insulated houses um, uh, where their uh, 
fuel bills, either gas or electricity, are a non-trivial part of their, their income. So what do you need there? You, you need to make sure you've got income support. You need to make sure uh, that you've got a, um, help to insulate houses, etc. But the total amounts of money to do it are not great. I mean, so I return to most of the issues of the just transition in the developed economies. When you look at the amount of money and redistribution and political vision we need to do it, is not all that big. We just need to do the policies. Then you get the sort of Africa, right? And again, there is a huge game played by the, um, the, the climate change deniers on this, which says, oh, you, you, you're standing in the way of African economic development by telling them about climate change. Well, first of all, there's absolutely nothing about us driving our decarbonisation, which is bad for Africa. Indeed, one of the most important bits of a just transition is for us to set such stretching carbon targets, because we can afford it, that that drives the technology that enables Africa to decarbonize at low cost. And that's actually what's happened, because we set stretching targets for renewables, and because in particular the Germans paid for very high subsidies for solar energy to start with, Solar technology is now available to Africa at a low cost, which is fully competitive with fossil fuels. And that should continue to be the case. The more that we set targets and stick to targets that we will be zero carbon by 2060, the more that we can be confident that there will be a supply of technologies becoming available, which enable poorer parts of the world you know, to develop and to become zero carbon, but at a lower cost than they would otherwise be. Thank you very much, Adair. I must know, so my last question is, how hopeful are you in light of all that you know? And okay. That's the question I've asked everyone. Um, compared with 2008, when I was the first chair of the UK Climate Change Committee, I am more convinced, much more convinced, that this is technologically resolvable. Uh, that we can decarbonise power, we can decarbonise trucking, shipping, and that it's all doable at a, a, an affordable cost to the global I still think there are, you know, there are still immense political challenges. There are uh, significant groups of people, I think, intellectually and morally irresponsible, who are climate change deniers, allied to short-term interest groups, and they are particularly powerful in the U.S. and they have um, played a significant role in the election of Donald Trump, who has given effectively corrupt paybacks by, you know, uh, levels of subsidy for coal, which are just and so, you know, it's a balance between the technological optimism that we can do this at low cost is higher than before um, versus, you know, a worry about what happened uh, with Trump. On the other hand, an awareness that after Trump pulled out of Paris, um, India did not. India didn't say, well, if they're pulling out, we're pulling out. Indeed, I go down to India fairly regularly. I think their level of commitment you know, to get on with a move towards more renewables, etc., is very strong. So, you know, what am I? I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that it can be doable. And uh, if something is doable, you have to get up each morning and do your little bit to make it more likely that it occurs. And, um, you know, we can win, and I hope we will. Thank you very much, Adair. Wonderful interview. Thank you so much.